Okay, today's daf is pay. We are starting four lines from the top. So, uh, four lines from the top, last word of the line on uh, daf pay, where it says metive. So, an objection is raised. Ketzad mishtatfin. So, we're talking about the shitufei mavo'ot. You have um, multiple courtyards. They open to one alley. The alley leads to the Rishut Arabim, to the public domain. So this alley is called the Mavoi, and in order for the various Chatserot, the various courtyards, to use the same shared Mavoi, they need to combine together in a Shitufei Mavoot, which is a combination, a partnership, that unites them into one group, okay, into one entity. Think of it like a corporation, basically. They, be, they incorporate. Yeah, they incorporate into one entity. So they all share it as one. So what do you do? What you do is you bring a barrel of wine, of oil, of dates, of figs, or some other type of fruit. Now if, there are two possibilities. So either, there are two ways to make the Eruv. One is you take your own food and you say, you know what? I don't want to bother asking each person to contribute. I'm just going to take my own barrel of fruit and I'm going to lizakot means I'm going to make it everybody else's. Okay? I'm going to, I'm going to transfer it to everybody else. Or if, if I decide that I'm going to use food that actually belongs to everybody else, then I need to let them know. Okay? So if I'm going to transfer it to them... If it's mine, I have to transfer it to them. If you come here, I could show you. If you come here, I could show you. If it's, my, if, if, it's, if it's mine, I have to transfer it to them. And if it's theirs, I have to let them know uh, we are um, right here. Right here. Fourth line, same. Okay. And if it's theirs, then I have to let them know that I'm going to use it. Let's say, for example, there was a communal stock of wine or something like that. And I go take the communal stock. I have to let everybody know I'm taking the property and I'm making the eruv. If it's mine, I don't have to tell them. I can give it to someone else. You give it to a third party. Uh, like the Mishnah said, you give it to your wife. You give it to your adult children. Ask them to accept it on behalf of everybody in the Mavoy, everybody in the community, that way you're transferring, because you can't just hold something and say, I'm giving this to everyone. You have to do something. So you give it to the third party. Now it belongs to everyone. Okay? And it says, how does that work? That, um, He has to pick it up off the ground a little bit to show that he's transferring it. So when you give it, let's say, to a third party, the third party has to lift it up to transfer it to everyone else. Now, what is the, what's the point here? In the Mishnah it said, they have to lift it a tefach. A tefach is a hand's breadth. In this Brayta it says, a mashehu, a tiny amount. That implies that it could be any amount. It doesn't have to be this much. Any amount. So the Gemara says, my mashu nami kamar tefach. The Brayta is not speaking precisely. When it says you pick it up a little bit, it means a tefach. It means this amount. In other words, they're not contradicting one another. They're just using different language. One is using precise language of measurement. One is using approximate language, saying pick it up a little bit, meaning this much. This is also a little bit. It's not three inches off the ground. Now we get to another question. Itmar was stated, Shitufei Mavot, Rav Amar Ein Tarech Lezakot, Ushmuel Amar Tarech Lezakot. Erovei Tichomein, Rav Amar Tarech Lezakot, Ushmuel Amar Ein Tarech Lezakot. So what's the question here? The question is, if I have food that I want to make a Shitufei Mavot, I want to make, or I want to make an Erovei Chatserot, I want to make a, I want to unify everybody in the courtyard into one entity. Because what's the problem? Whenever you have multiple ownership, it's considered like a public area. Now I can't carry in the public area. So instead of having public and multiple ownership, we consolidate into one. So let's say I take the food and I say, okay, I'm going to make it for everybody else. So the question is, tzarich lezakot, do I have to make it belong to everybody or not? Or can I just donate it? It's a, I'll take my own. I'll say, okay, here's the erovei chatzerot with my food. Or do I have to transfer it to everyone's possession, that it belongs to everyone? So Shmuel says... When it, Rav says, when it comes to the Chatzer or to the Mavoi, you don't have to transfer it to everybody. It's not necessary. 
But when it comes to Eruve Techumin, the other kind of Eruv is where you put bread outside the city, because you're only allowed to go 2,000 damot outside the city limits. You want to go an extra two, you want to go 4,000. So what do you do? You put your Eruve Techumin, you go, you walk before Shabbat, 2,000 damot out of the city limits, and you put the Eruve Techumin right there. So now you get an additional 2,000 damot in that direction. On Shabbat. So let's say the community wants to do that. Let's say there's a bar mitzvah going on in the next town. Everybody's going. Or whatever. There's some simcha going on. Everybody's going. So the whole community wants to make Erovei Tuchumin. So what do they do? Or like I lived in a community where the place where we had the minyan was outside the Tuchum. For some of the houses. Like the people in one part of the neighborhood had to pass through a, uh, an energy plant which was not a residential area, there was more than 2,000 damot. So we had to put an Erovei Tuchumin every Shabbat. So it's for everybody. They didn't ask me personally, do you want it? The, you know, the rabbi would uh, be mizakeh. He would transfer it to everyone, and then we all own it. Now, but here's the question. Do you need... What? I didn't hear you. What happened if... If once Shabbat starts, it's good. If it's before Shabbat, it's a problem. <clears throat> but once Shabbat starts, it's good for the whole Shabbat. Now, the, so Rav says like this. When it comes to chatzer, when it comes to the courtyard, I don't have to give my food as a gift to everybody. I can just make the Eruv with my food and assume that you want to be part of it. When it comes to Eruv I have to actually transfer it to you. And Shmuel says the opposite. He says, when it comes to the chatzer, there you have to share with everybody. Okay? But when it comes to techumin, if the community is making an eruvei techumin to extend the st- where they can walk on Shabbat, they don't have to transfer it to everyone. So, Rashi, so the question is, what's the difference? So, Now, Shmuel's position makes sense. Why? Because in the Mishnah, it said... It only mentioned the idea of transferring the food to everybody with the chatzerot. It said, if you're unifying the courtyard or you're unifying everybody for use of the alleyway, so then you have to take the food and transfer the ownership to everyone. And when it comes to tichumin, extending the distance you can walk on Shabbat, it never mentioned anything about transferring the food to everyone. So therefore, it sounds like that makes perfect. So Shmuel is being consistent. He says, wherever it says you have to, you have to. Wherever it says you don't have to, you don't have to. But Rav, Rav, But according to Rav, you got a problem because Rav seems to do the opposite, right? In the the Mishnah said that you need to transfer the food to everyone when you want to unify everyone for the for the courtyard or for the mavoi, and Rav says you don't need to. And then when it comes to the Tuchumin, where it never says anything about doing a, uh, about transferring the food, there it says you have to. So what, what, why is that? So, and, and the Rashi and Tosafot here explain the logic behind the two sides also, because there's a logic behind it. In other words, when it comes to, let's say, Chatzerot, okay, there, the logic that you have to give so Tosafot says, the reason why you have to give is because it's a type of a, an acquisition. Okay, it's a type of an acquisition, so a person has to consciously be a part of it. In other words, they have to actually acquire something. They can't be p- totally passive, but they have to participate on some level. Whereas when it comes to techum, you're only allowed to make an Eruvei techumin for a mitzvah. So therefore, if we're doing a mitzvah, I don't need to transfer the... I don't, you don't need to participate. I can do it for you. I'm going to set up the techum so that you can go do the mitzvah. I'm not going to ask you, and I don't have to transfer the food to your property because I'm doing it on your behalf. I'm doing what's... what's you know, I know what's best for you. It's going to do the mitzvah, to go to this Brit Milan in the next town. I don't have to ask you. Okay? Mm-hmm. It could be, it could be. Here, I'm not even telling you. I just, I just set it up for you. Okay? And I don't even have to involve you. I don't have to transfer ownership to you. I don't have to do anything. Whereas Rav is saying the opposite. He's saying, you know what? In Chatzerot, when it comes to the Chatzer, that's where I don't need to do anything. Why not? Because everybody wants an Eruvei Chatzerot. Because otherwise we can't carry in the courtyard. But not everybody wants an Eruvei Tichumin. Because maybe one guy says, I don't want to go to the Brit Milah. 
I wanted to go the other direction to my friend's house for tea in the afternoon and now I can't go because you put the tichum over there. Right? So we don't know. All right. But anyway, in terms of sources, Shmuel is well sourced because it says in the Mishnah, for Hatserot, you need to give the food to everyone. So the food belongs to everybody. They all share it. When it comes to Tuchumin, it doesn't say that. One person can go set up the Eruvei Tuchumin for everybody and we don't have to actually possess the food that he puts there. He puts his own food there. That's fine. So, but why does Rav say the opposite? So, Tanaihi, it's actually a machlok at Tanaim, the Amar Rav Yudah, Amar Rav, because Rav Yudah said the name of Rav. There was a story with the daughter-in-law of Rabbi Oshaya, she went to the bathhouse, she went to the spa on Friday, and what happened was the spa was outside of the Tehom, and it becomes Shabbat, the Ervala Chamotah. So, what happened was her mother-in-law was very nice. She set up an Eruvei Techumin. She realized that her daughter-in-law was not going to be able to make it all the way back from the spa. In, it, was, it was more than 2,000 damot outside, uh, uh, outside of the city. So she would be stranded. So she put an Eruvei Techumin there so that now the daughter can walk to the Eruvei Techumin and walk the rest of the way into the city. Very nice of her. Obama said, but the, but the situation came before Rabbi Chia. He said, she can't come. She has to stay in the city that has the uh, that has the uh, merchatz that has the uh, that has the bathhouse. Amar the Rabbi Shmuel bar Rabbi Yosi. Rabbi Shmuel bar Rabbi Yosi said to him, "Bavlai, you Babylonian, or it could be Bavlai, you Babylonians. Kol kach atam machmir be'eruvin. You're so strict about eruvin. Kach Amar Abba. This is what father said." Kol, that meaning Rabbi Yosef said, "Kol sheyesh lachal akel be'eruvin hakel. The more lenient you can be about eruvin, the you should be." So in other words, he's telling him, don't be so strict. You're wrong. So it's a machloket, right? According to Rab- Rabbi Chia, the Eruv was not valid. Now, the Gemara is going to tell us why it wasn't valid, but it wasn't valid. According to Rabbi Yishmael, the son of Rabbi Yossi, we, we, we rule leniently and we say it was valid. And the girl could have come back. Okay. So, the Ibailo and the question was this. Mishel chamotah irva la'u mishum de la zikhtala. O dilma mishela irva la'u mishum de la shela midata. So the question is like this. What's the reason why Rabbi Chia prohibited it? Was it because the mother-in-law used her own food? And as we just said before, you, some say, Rav says, you have to transfer the ownership of the food to the person whose techum it is. You can't just put your own food there for them. Or, is there, uh, or maybe no, maybe she used the daughter-in-law's food. The only thing was, the daughter-in-law wasn't informed in advance. Maybe you need to be informed in advance. So, Amar Lahen, Hahu Merabanan, one of the rabbis, Rabbi Yaakov Shimei, named Rabbi Yaakov said, the didi la to Rabbi Yohanan. Rabbi Yohanan personally explained the situation to me. That the situation was that the mother-in-law used her own food to make the Eruv and didn't transfer ownership of the food to the daughter-in-law. So therefore the daughter-in-law can't use the, uh, the Eruv because it's not hers. It has to be hers. Amale Rabbi Zera le Rabbi Yaakov. It should say the it should say Bira de Bat Yaakov. The Rabbi Yaakov, the son of the daughter of Yaakov. Okay, so Rabbi Zera said to this individual, "Ki matita tam." When you go there, Akiv vezil le Sulamad detzur. Go to the Sulamad detzur. Go to the uh, literally it means the. Uh, the uh, uh, ladder of Tzor, but it means the, the road of Tzor. Go out of your way. And and ask Rabbi Yaakov Bar Idi what really happened. So they still don't believe that they know exactly what the case was. What was the reason why Rabbi Chiyad didn't allow her to use this Eruv Etichumin? Was it because the do- it, was, it didn't belong to the daughter-in-law? Or was it because the daughter-in-law wasn't informed? Amar Lehi said to him, Mishel Chamota Irvala, Mishum Dela Zichtala, that it was because Rabbi Chia said, you need to own it. And it was the mother-in-law's food that she put there to make the Eruv. So, what's the point? The point here is that according to Rabbi Chia, the person who's going to benefit from the Eruv must own it. According to Rabbi Ishmael, the son of Rabbi Yossi, he was saying, you don't need that. So we see it's a machlok at Tanaim. So, Rabbi, uh, so Rav is holding like Rabbi Chia. Shmuel is holding like Rabbi Shmuel, the son of Rabbi Yosei. 
the lenient view. Okay, now the Gemara, as Tosafot points out here, according to this interpretation, the Gemara never accounted for why Rav was stricter, I'm, I'm sorry, was more lenient about Chatzerot. It never explained to us why he ignores our Mishnah that says that when it comes to uniting a courtyard, you need to also own the food. He ignores that. Okay, and he says you don't need to. Rashi says, Rav Tanahu Upalig. Rav had such authority, he could disagree with the Mishnah. Which, because he was the first generation Amorai, he was very, very prominent, he could disagree with the Mishnah. Tosafot says, no, maybe the story about the daughter-in-law wasn't about Erove Tuchomin, maybe it was really about Erove Chatzerot for some, somehow. That she wasn't there to participate in the Erove Chatzerot before Shabbat because she was at the spa, she was at the uh, uh, bathhouse. Okay? And therefore, really, that's what the case was. So we don't know for sure. Gilyon HaShas of Rabbi Akiva Eger on the side explains that it could be that Rav simply um, operates with the premise that Eruvei Techomin are more strict than Eruvei Chatzerot. So if you could show that really Eruvei Techomin didn't require the person to own the food, so certainly Eruvei Chatzerot is not going to require it because Eruvei Chatzerot is more lenient. It's more lenient because it doesn't have a basis in the Torah. It's purely rabbinic. And it's also more lenient because a person naturally wants, automatically wants Eruvei Chatzerot. So, but Rav is stringent about Eruvei Tuchumin. He just doesn't extend the stringency to Chatzerot, to the courtyards. So that's, that's, that's the way that Gil Yonashas explains it. But anyway, that's what Rav says. Now, Amar Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman said, Naktinan, we, we decide, Echad Eruvet Chomein, Echad Eruvet Chatzerot, Echad Shetufei Mavuot, Tzarech Lezakot, that in all cases, Rav Nachman says, we need to transfer ownership of the food to the other person. So whether we're dealing with Eruvet Chomein, you want to make an Eruvet Chomein for me, you need to transfer, you need to go to somebody else, have them receive it on my behalf, and transfer it to, to me, so that I own part of it. You can't just bring food there and say, oh, I put an Eruvet Chomin for you. Aren't I a nice guy? It doesn't work. Same with Chatzerot. Same with Mavot. So any one of these Eruvin needs to be done in such a way that the participants or the beneficiaries of it own the food. This is an interesting question. What about Eruvei Tavshilin? What's Eruvei Tavshilin? That's where Yom Tov falls out on Thursday and Friday, or falls out on Friday, and you want to cook from Friday to Shabbat. So you make Eruvei Tavshilin before the holiday. You set aside food, and you say, this is Eruvei Tavshilin. I started preparing for Yom Tov already. I started preparing for Shabbat already. And therefore, I can continue preparing for Shabbat on Yom Tov. Now, the halacha is, you can set up an Eruvei Tavshilin for somebody else. For instance, the rabbi can make his Eruvei Tavshilin, which most rabbis do. When they make the Eruvei Tavshilin, they say, for us and for all the people who live in the town. So just in case somebody forgot to make Eruvei Tavshilin on Yom Tov, they can cook on that Yom Tov for Shabbat. Right. They can't purposely say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to rely on the rabbi. But if they forgot, they can rely on it. Now the question is, does the rabbi or whoever it is have to transfer ownership to everyone? And so the Gemara says, and in Masechet Betzad talks about this in detail. So Rav Nachman asks, is the same halacha. Amar Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef says, Umay tiba ilay. What is the question? Lo shimi alehad Amar Rav Nachman barav. Amar Shmuel. Didn't Rav Nachman know what Rav Nachman bar, uh, bar uh, Rav Ada said in the name of Shmuel? Eruvei tavshilin tzarech lezakot. That Eruvei tavshilin you have to transfer ownership of it to the person. So that's why when the rabbi does Eruvei Tavshilin, he has to take it, give it to someone else, and say, receive this on behalf of everybody in the town. All the Jews in the town, that they own a part of it. Okay? A fraction, but it doesn't matter. That's what it says in Masechet Betzah. So didn't Rav Nachman know about this? Abaye said to Rav Yosef, his teacher, Pshitad mighty ba'ilei. He said to him, of course he didn't hear the teaching. If he heard the teaching, why would he ask the question? What, what, what would he ask? Amarle, he answered him. What do you mean? Just because Rav, Rav Nachman hears a teaching doesn't mean he accepts it. 
because he heard the teaching of Shmuel that said that you don't need to transfer ownership of Eruvei Techomin. If you want to extend the distance you can walk on Shabbat, you don't have to transfer ownership. And yet he said you do anyway. So obviously Rav Nachman doesn't care what he hears from Shmuel. He says whatever he wants. Okay, but Hachi there's no comparison, says Abaye. There's no comparison. Why? That's a different story. Rav and Shmuel are arguing. Remember, they argued whether you needed to transfer ownership of the Eruvei Tuchumin and whether you needed to transfer ownership of Eruvei Chatzerot. And what, does Rav, what did Rav Nachman say? We're going to be stringent in all the cases. You always have to do it. Okay, but here in Eruvet Tavshilin, there's no other opinion. There's only one opinion. You have to do it. And since there's only one opinion, you have to do it. Why would we assume Rav Nachman would say you don't have to do it, right? Why, why would we assume? Uh, you know, why would we? Why would he ask the question if he knew that you have to do it, right? Because there's no other opinion. So therefore, of course, he didn't hear the teaching, so he was asking the question. But the halacha is, you need to transfer it. So now the Gemara says, "Hahu Turzina." There was a Turzina, which was a non-Jewish guy who was in charge of the armory of the town. Now the halacha is that if you have a non-Jewish person who lives in your courtyard, he can't participate in the Eruvei Chatzerot because he's not Jewish. So what you have to do is rent his rights to the courtyard. You go to him and say, I'm going to give you a dollar. I'm renting your rights to the courtyard so we can combine it with the rest of the Jewish community. However, Amarle, they said to him, Ogir lan reshutach. They said, please rent it to us. Lo ogir lo, you wouldn't do it. So, Atu lekamei de Rebizera, they went to Rebizera, Amrule, they said to him, Ma'ul lemegal midvitu. Apparently his wife was nicer. So they said, could we talk to his wife? Maybe his wife will lend it. Will rent it to us. Amarle, he said to them, Hachi Amar Rabbi, Resh Lakish Mishmeh de Gavar Rabbah. This is what Resh Lakish said in the name of a great person, Umar Rabbi Hanina, who is Rabbi Hanina. In other words, Rish Lakish said this in the name of Rabbi Hanina. Okay, a person's wife can make the Eruv without telling him. Behind his back. There was another similar case of the head of the armory living in the town of Rav Yehuda Bar Oshaya. So again, they asked him to rent his space. He wouldn't do it. Again, they asked the rabbi, can we rent from his wife? So um, what did he do? He didn't know. They went to Rav Matana. He didn't know either. They went to Rav Yudah. Amar said to them, This is what Shmuel said. That Shmuel said that you can have the, the wife can do it without the husband's permission. There is an objection. But it says in Abraita that women who go ahead and make an Eruv Echatzerot without telling their husbands or against the will of their husbands, it's not valid. So how can you tell me it's valid? It depends. In a case where they simply want to make an Eruv, there... They can't do it. But in a case where they're interfering with everybody else, in other words, they're ruining everyone else's life, there we can go to them and we can have them participate. But in a case where, it's, where they're not prohibiting, in other words, they just want to join in. Let's say, there's a, you know, they, let's say they live in a separate courtyard and they want to, we're making an Eruv in our courtyard and they want to join in with our courtyard. But really they could be separate or they could join us. They want to join us, but against their husband's will, then it's no good. But if they're in our courtyard and without their participation, everyone is going to be restricted. Nobody's going to be able to carry. There we allow them to do it even behind their husband's back. Okay? So, um, this must be the case. Because otherwise, Shmuel contradicted himself. It says that a person who regularly participated in the shituf, in the eruv, and one week he didn't do it. Okay, so what, what can you do? You can actually go into his house and take it from him against his will. What does it mean? Go to his wife. Right? In other words, you can go behind his back. Have his wife give it to you. 
So why? Regil in, shein regil lo. It specifies somebody who normally participates in the Eruv. Meaning, he's, non, he's angry at everybody. And in order to spite you, he's not going to do it this week. So you can't carry anything into the courtyard. Nobody's going to be able to come with their strollers, nothing. Right? He wants to do it on purpose. Lachis. You know, he doesn't like it. So then you can go to his wife and say, please, you know, the wives are a more, you know, a more compassionate. They will listen. They'll understand. Okay. You can do it. But if he doesn't prohibit everybody else, in other words, let's say there were two chatzerot next to each other. One is independent of the other, but they could join. They have a door between them. You can't go to the wives in the other uh, courtyard and try to get them to join with you because they're not interfering with our lives. So we can't go behind the backs of the husbands. But when they're interfering, now we, now we pull out all the stops. We can do what we need to. So therefore we see that that's the case. We have a similar halacha that says you can force a person to make the lechi v'korat lamavoy. What this means is these alleyways. So you had these courtyards that would empty into an alleyway. The alleyway was a dead end. Okay, it was closed on three sides and only opened on one side into the uh, public domain. So when you would come out, you would come to the edge and the open space, the open door, so to speak, the open side, went right into the public domain. So in order to allow people to carry in there, you needed to put a lechi or a korah. A korah is a bar that goes over the top. Lechi is one that goes on the side, vertical. So you have to put it there to remind people so they know where they can't walk past. Carrying things, okay? Right, there's a limit. So, so it says you can force people to pay for this. In other words, it's, you can tax them. You go to them and say, listen, we need the lechi and the Korah to be maintained. You don't want to use it? I don't care. You have to pay. You have to pay. So, we turn to Amud Bet Shani Atam. Deleka Mechitzot. That's a different story. Because there, in other words, from the fact that we can force somebody to, put, to pay for adjusting the physical par- parameters of the Mavoy, maybe we should infer that we can also force them or manipulate or talk to their wife or whatever we have to do in order to get them to uh, uh, participate in the food part of the Eruv, where we combine food together, or we, you know, in order to allow us to carry. Maybe they're the same. So the Gemara says, no, Shanayatam Deleka Mechitzot, that's a different story, because that has to do with the physical structure of the Mavoy, not having Mechitzot, not being closed on the fourth side. There we can say, listen, we need to make a Tikkun, we need to fix the Mavoy physically. There, he's a, there he'll participate. We can force him to participate. Okay? Um, but when it comes to, Tosafot explains, when it comes to the Eruvei Chatzerot, that's about joining our residences together. You can't force somebody to do that. That's a personal choice. A physical correction of the Mavoy to make it a private domain, there we can force him to do it. But whether he wants to participate with us in some collaborative thing, he doesn't want to do it. That's his choice. Okay? Lishana acharina, another interpretation, mitzad shane. Now the word mitzad here is almost everybody takes it out and says it's a mistake. Some say it says it should say din shane. That there's a difference between what we can do behind someone's back and what we can sue them in court. In other words, you can go to the court and say this guy refuses to pay for the adjustment of the alley by putting the uh, thing. He doesn't pay his taxes. That's through the court. But we're talking about going behind the guy's back to his wife. That's a different story. You can't infer one from the other. Okay? And even though you can't infer one from the other, the halakha still remains that if this family is ruining it for everyone else, we can go to the wife. We're allowed to. But we can't necessarily prove that from the fact that we can force the guy to pay for other adjustments. Because those other adjustments are of a different nature and a different circumstance. The Gemara says, Itmar was stated. Remember yesterday we talked about the Asherah, the idolatrous tree. He says you can take a piece of wood from the idol tree and you can make it the Lechi. Because the Lechi doesn't have to have a measurement. So therefore, even though it's in, we, we look at something that's an idol as if it's nothing, we're still allowed to use it. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish Amar Osin Kora Asherah. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says you can even make the board that goes over the top of the Mavoy. You can make it from an asherah, from an, idol, an idolatrous tree. Now, according to the one that says that you can put a korah 
you can put the horizontal beam, if that's how you decide to set the perimeter of the, of the mavoy, you, then you can take that from an idol. So certainly alechi. Why? Because a Korah has to have a measurement. It has to have actually a measurement of at least this much, at least a tefach. So it has to be significant. And you're taking something that halachically is viewed as non-existent. Because it's an idol that's supposed to be burnt. Okay? So if someone's going to allow you to use it for the Korah, because it's for a mitzvah, then certainly for the lechi, because the lechi has no required measurement. However, the one who says you can use it for the lechi, the, v- the vertical stick, doesn't allow you to use it for the horizontal, because the vertical doesn't have to have a measurement, but the horizontal does. And what's the distinction? Because we view something that's from an idol as halachically not having a measurement. Because it's condemned to be destroyed. So when we look at it, we see something that doesn't have any measurement, doesn't have any significance. So since the Korah needs to have significance, we're going to say it doesn't count. A lechi might count, but not the Korah. So that's the machloket. Do we say... So, and the halacha is that for a lechi you can use it because a lechi doesn't have to have any required measurement. But for a korah, where it needs to have a required measurement, this cannot meet the standard of measurement because it's viewed as destroyed. Destroyed. It's viewed as destroyed. Like, imagine it was just crumbled to ashes. Now, next Mishnah says, Nitma'et ochel mosifu Let's say you, you, are the in, you are in charge of the Eruvei Chatzerot. And what happens is that the food gets used up or it uh, wastes away, or it gets lost. So you can add to it. When you add to it, you have to transfer also whatever you add to everyone. So you have to make it a collective possession. But you don't have to tell everybody. You take care of it. However, if there are new people who move in, you have to add food. You have to transfer ownership of the food to everyone, including the new residents. And you have to tell people that, by the way, there are new residents included in the Eruv. So it says, So, uh, I'm sorry. How much do you have to put in? If there are a lot of people in the Chatzar, you need the amount of food of two meals. Uh... For everybody. When it's a small number of people, a fig's worth of food for each person. So let's say you have three people living in the Chatzar. So you just need three figs worth. One fig for each person. Rabbi Yosei says, that's when you start the Eruv. But let's say the Eruv wastes away over time. Or it gets eaten over time. And now all you have is a little bit left. As long as you have a little bit, that's enough. It doesn't have to maintain the measurement all the time. You just have to start with the right measurement. And we don't care what happens afterwards. And the only reason why we require Eruvei Chatzirot is so, people don't, so the children don't forget. What that means is there were two things that they would do. They would, do, they would take one set of food to unite the courtyard. And then the multiple courtyards that share the alley would take food and unite to use the alleyway. So really, uniting to use the alleyway encompasses everything, because that means that all the different courtyards are all one. We shouldn't need to make an eruv for each individual courtyard, and also an eruv for the mavoy. In, you don't need a, a domestic and international. You know, just one, an inter-courtyard collaboration is enough for everybody. It, it, it includes everybody. However, we don't want the children to lose the idea of Eruvei Chatzerot because maybe they'll be in a situation where they, oh, they don't have an alleyway. There isn't more than one courtyard. There's one courtyard only. We don't want them to think that one courtyard only, you don't need anything. So for each courtyard, we make an Eruv and we make an Eruv for the, for the multi-courtyard to share the alley. Now the Gemara says, but my asking, what are we talking about here in the Mishnah? When it says if the food is diminished, you add food and you don't have to tell anybody. So what's it talking about? If it's talking about that you're adding the same food. Let's say you had, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, you had uh, rice. I'm just making it up. So you add more rice. Then even if you completely ran out of rice, you should be able to replenish it. 
Because it's no new thing. Everybody knows there was rice there. You're taking the same rice. You're transferring the ownership of the rice to everybody. Nobody should have any complaints. It's the same thing you had before. Ella bishnei minin. Rather, we must mean that originally you had rice. And now you're replacing it with oatmeal. So maybe some people don't want that. So you can't, uh, you can't do it. Afilu nitma it namilo. Then even if the rice, originally you had a whole pot of rice. Now you only have half a pot of rice. So you decide, you know what, I'm going to add onto it oatmeal, the other half. So there, afilo nitma it, even if you didn't run out of rice, even if you just ran out of half the rice and you want to replenish with, uh, with oatmeal, still you, it wouldn't be good. Because we said that if you have two different types, you have to tell everyone. So basically, what do you have? If we're talking about a case where you had only one food in the Eruf and you're going to replenish it and it became diminished and, you have, and you're going to replenish it with the same food, even if it was completely depleted, you can replenish it with the same food. And if we're talking about replenishing with a different food, even if it was only diminished a little bit, you can't. So in what case of diminishing, of partial diminishing, do you, have to, do you not have to tell everybody? Okay, because in a case of, of, a, of partial diminishing, if you're going to replace it with something else, you still have to tell everybody. If you're replacing it with the same thing, then even total diminishing is good. Now, the Gemara says, There's two possible answers. nitmatmet. What it means in the Mishnah when it says nitma'it, that it became diminished, is that it completely was used up. And since it was completely used up, you're actually starting from scratch. So you're going to, so the chidush is, the novelty is, you're going to be adding from scratch the same item, but it was completely gone. <clears throat> yeah, chatzerot. So you're going to add the, uh, you know, the ibayt ema, alternatively, mishne minin, that you're re- replenishing, kalashani. But when you're completely, when you completely run out, it's different. So Rashi explains on the side that, that, uh, when it says kala, okay, th- that really, according to the second version, you need, in order to have to tell everybody, you need two problems. You need it to be completely exhausted, and you need to be using a different thing. But if you're either using a different thing, but you, it wasn't completely, it wasn't completely uh, finished, or you are uh, using the same thing, even if it was completely finished, then you don't have to tell everybody. So according to the first version, one or the other, you have to tell. If you either completely used it up or you're using a new item to replenish, you have to tell everybody. However, in the second, view, in the second version, if you, the only time you have to tell everyone is if you have two problems, which is that you are using a new food and the original food is completely gone. But if there's a remnant of the original food or you're using the same food as before, then you're good. Okay, now the Gemara says, Nitosifu alehen, Mosifu mizakeh. If you have new residents, you have to add more. Amar Rav Shizvi, Amar Rav Chizda. Rav Shizvi said that Rav Chizda said, Zotomeret chalukin alav chaverav al Rabbi Yehuda. This shows you that Rabbi Yehuda's friends disagreed with him. What does that mean? It's not as it says in the next, in, in Mishnah coming up on the next daf. Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Bamed Varim Amarim, Bar Rabbi Tichumin, Aval Bar Rabbi Chatzirot, Ma Aravin Ben Ladat, Ben Shalol Ladat. That it says that Rabbi Yehuda said, when it comes to Eruvet Tichumin, which is placing food outside the city limit so people can walk further, there we say, you have to let people know. If they don't know, then the Eruv is not going to count for them. Because they have to intend that they want it. But Eruv Echatzerot, Ben Ladat, Ben Shalol Ladat. You don't have to tell the person. Because everybody wants an Eruv Echatzerot, Rabbi Yehuda said. So what do you see though from our Mishnah? Our Mishnah says that you have to let people know. So that means even Eruv Echatzerot, the rabbi said, you, you need to let people know. Only Rabbi Yehuda said no. So the Gemara says, Pshita de Chalukin, Mahu de Tema. In other words, obviously they disagreed. That's why the Mishnah says that Rabbi Yehuda says you don't need to inform people about the Eruve Chatzerot. Only Rabbi Yehuda says that. Everybody else disagreed. So Mahu de Tema, what might you think? Hani Mileva Chatzer, Sheben Shene Mavoot, Aval Chatzer Shal Mavoy Echad, Emalo, Kamash Malan. That you might have thought, when do the rabbis disagree with Rabbi Yehuda? When there are two mavo'ot, in other words, there were two possible choices, and you went ahead and decided for everyone else which one of the alleys you were going to join with. 
You decided to join with Ali A. Maybe I wanted Ali B. Right? So there is where there's a machloket between Rabbi Yehuda and the Chachamim. The Chachamim Rabbi Yehuda says, as long as you chose one, it's good enough. The Chachamim say, no, you, you, unless you tell everybody which one we're joining, how can you decide which one to join? Since there are two options, there's the, there's the uh, alley over there that's shared by uh, other Chatzerot, and there's alley over there with the other one. How do you know which one? So you might have thought that's the only case where we have to tell people, where there's two options. But normally, maybe you would think that everybody wants to be part of the Eruv Chatzerot. You don't need to tell them. So Kamash Valana comes to tell you that no, you need to inform the people that there's an Eruv Chatzerot being made, even though they have nothing to lose by it, you still need to inform them no matter what. Now the last part of the Gemara that we're going to do for today's Kamahu Shiuro, what is the measurement of Eruv Chatzerot? So he says, Kamahu Mirubin. It said if there are a lot of people, then you need the amount of food for two meals. What's a lot of people? It's relative, right? So Amar Rav Yudam, Rav Rav Yudam, says, Shmuel says, Shmona Asre Bnei Adam. It means 18 people. 18. All it is is 18 people. It doesn't mean only 18 people. It means anything 18 above, that's a lot of people. What is the reason why it mentions 18? In other words, why, why 18? Amar Rav Yitzchak, B'Rei Rav Yehuda, Rav Yitzchak, the son of Rav Yehuda said, L'didi mifarshali minei da'aba. Father taught me, meaning Rav Yehuda taught me, Explicitly, kol sheilu mechalek kol the mazon shetei seudot benehen ve'en magat giro geret the kol echad v'echad hen hen mirubin. That where did they get this definition of many people being eighteen? Because if you divide up the mazon shetei seudot, you have mazon shetei seudot. You have the food of two meals, and you divide it up evenly. If you divide it up evenly among eighteen people, you will end up with. A fig's worth of food for each person, which is what we said before. If it's a small group, it's a fig's worth of food for each person. Okay, so it's no, so what you're going to have? I'm sorry, I skipped a part. If you have anything that you split up, so what he says is that if you have any amount of people. That if you were to divide up the food, they would have less than a fig's worth each. That's considered a lot. Anything where you would divide up the food and they would have at least a fig's worth or more, then that's considered a small number. And what's the cutoff? 18 people. Once you have 18 people, they're not, it's not going to work anymore. And the Gemara says, so the Mishnah actually teaches us something interesting, what they call Agav Orcha. By the way, how does it, what does it teach us? It teaches us that 18 people, that the amount of food that's defined as for two meals is 18 figs. Because, how do you know that? Because it says that you could divide the two Seudot among 18 people. And there would be a fig for each person, a fig's worth, a fig's volume for each person. What does that mean? That means that, that two se'udot is equivalent of, is the equivalent of 18 figs in volume. And that's actually the, you know, so the Mishnah, by telling you the number 18, is teaching you that idea. But really it works on a ratio. Really it works on a mathematical principle. It's not arbitrary that it's just 18, we pick the number 18. It's not arbitrary. It's that once the two meals worth of food would be subdivided and would end up being less than uh, one fig per person, then we just say, that's a lot of people and we're just going to go with the two meals. If it's less than, 18 is exactly two meals. That's exactly a fig for each person. And anything less than 18, you have to have a fig for each person. But once you meet that critical mass of two seudot, which is 18 figs, which means there would be enough for 18 people, anything past that number, you don't have to go on a case-by-case basis. If there's 100 people, you don't have to have 100 figs. You just need 18. But it teaches you what is that minimal amount of, eight, it's eight, of two seudot, it's 18 figs.